Yeah, so welcome to our workshop. We're very thrilled that SF24 is taking place, 24 hours. We've been part of uh, kind of in the organizing loop and uh, the closer it got, the more excited we got. And we're so thrilled to see so many people here and we hope that we can camp out with many of you for the next 24 hours. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, so what led us to come up with the idea of this workshop, Domini, so we heard a little bit about microanalysis and about an interactional view um, in, the, in the plenary already. And Dominic and I are really, really passionate about, um, well, I think most of all passionate about an interactional view. And um, we, with looking at microanalysis, this really allows us to embrace this view. And um, well, some of you might know, some of you might not. Um, we did a two and a half year journey traveling in our motorhome. We painted with solution focused messages and um, one of the ideas of this journey was really to, to embrace solution focus and um, to really also embrace this interactional view more and more. And we are still noticing the space there is for being more interactional. And it's an interesting journey. We um, heard of microanalysis first through uh, Harry Corman on a summer retreat, Seoul summer retreat, then uh, through Wolfgang and Marianne Geiswinkel, then we did the microanalysis, Marianne Rösler and Wolfgang Geiswinkel, yeah. Then we did the microanalysis, uh, first microanalysis online course, and really got into that. And um, the more we, yeah, the more we got into this, uh, I would say special perspective, the more we got interested. So we went on our journey, went to um, almost all the people who um, wrote about microanalysis in this way we went to Janet Bavalas, her team, and also um, Sarah Smog Jordan, for example, Peter De Jong, um, Adam Freer, and others who were part of kind of the International Microanalysis Associates. And what was really interesting is that uh, there is, like Elfie said, still so much learning that uh, there is, and we believe that with microanalysis and through microanalysis or through this interactional view and lens that solution focus will change. Um, because uh, like Mark mentioned that beautiful in the um, panel, it's, if you look at it through this lens, you see something that happens together, that we do together, that everybody in there has a part in that, and that we mutually contribute to the co-construction of meaning. And in this workshop, we would like to introduce you to our take and how this co-construction in our view could happen. It's just one version. Now uh, we went slightly away from things that uh, were there already through microanalysis and uh, twitched that a little bit uh, also for our trainings. That's how we train that. And uh, yeah, to really see and kind of talk about how does the co-construction of hope and change and other things that we want in solution focused conversations really take place. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a questions and yet yeah, a listening and it's, also much more than that. And we are really happy that you're here and you join our journey here. Yeah, and one of the things that along this journey is that we still notice that we have a lot, a lot of words for describing, you know, what one person does or mm. what another person does, but we do not have so much words for describing mm. interactions. It's like, it's really like, again, learning a kind of different language and in solution focus I think we have a lot of tools or, or not tools we have a lot of of ways of looking at interactions that are very helpful and that help to bring that to come alive mm. yeah there's a um, an example that you might have heard when you listen to the simply focus podcast when we were with Janet Bavalis um, that really is still with us and we see that every day happening to us <laughs> we're always amazed that the uh, you can get into this interactional view more and more. And there were two stories happening. Actually, it was one story, but you can explain it or describe it in two different ways. Her daughter, Bibiana, was running around. And Pippin, Janet has a huge Newfoundland dog, Janet Bavalis, and uh, Pippin, um, well, they got used to each other and they, they really liked each other and they got around. And um, Bibiana was afraid at first, and, but then she wasn't again, again because they... You know, got in touch with each other. And then uh, Jennifer Gerving's dogs came. 
She had three Shelties. And uh, they were really, really um, picking on Bibi, you, know, you could say. And Bibi was afraid and she was screaming. And the dogs, they really kind of uh, picked on her and they did even more of that. And uh, suddenly Pippin came and went in between and protected Bibi. That's one story. <laughs> yeah, and then there is another story. So there was um, this big Newfoundland dog. Um, Janet's dog and Bibi always reacted in a way that um, you could interpret as being afraid of the dog. So whenever Pippin came close to her, she she started to um, to to move a bit faster and she started to breathe a bit higher and she started to dance around. And um, Janet taught Bibi in a very beautiful way how, how she could behave by turning her back around when Pippin comes, um, that, um, to show her like, yeah, that she, she doesn't want to interact right now. And um, so the, the two, Bibi, well, um, after after time, Bibi didn't react in that way anymore. And you see how difficult it is to tell a story <laughs> without internal elements <laughs> going on, really interact interactional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, so Jennifer Gerving, who is also part of of Janet Bevelas team and does amazing research in the field of microanalysis, she has three dogs, three Shelties, and they came to visit. And um, so there was. Bibi and the three Shelties jumping around and Bibi again, you know, started to move faster and the Shelties started to move faster and Pippin went between the two of them, or the, the, the th four, yeah. four of them. And um, that, and all of a sudden Bibi could calmer, started to move slower and the Shelties went away. And that's just one, just two stories of one story. Um, when BB went in between, we said to Janet, oh, isn't that nice how um, Pippin protects BB? And Janet says, said, well, it's nice how it just goes in between. We're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. it's difficult to, kind of, to even talk in an interactional way because we're used to having so many concepts about the inner elements, about uh, what people think what they what they uh, are are kind of what's going on in them because uh, making, and up, making things up things in their heads or bodies or wherever people are animals i think with animals we do that a lot too we animals so. too yeah <laughs> so that's uh, and whenever we see that and we notice ourselves again and again and it's good to have two of us so one can notice that and the other one <laughs> it's okay uh, we we see the potential that it still has and one thing we would like to show you now is uh, our very specific take on co-construction and um, kind of uh, yeah, conceptualize that and also go through a little conversation piece and discuss uh, what you think, how we might co-construct uh, hope and change. But before we come to that, yeah, we would briefly love to invite you to use the chat and share with us what you are curious about. So just write in the chat what are you curious about maybe we can with take, regards to this session maybe <laughs> maybe we can take one or two inspirations during that workshop No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll read that, Mark. So, what are others curious about? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Nice, yeah. Jenny, it's always interesting to uh, see how we two behave with each other. <laughs> there are many stories about kind of uh, like the Bibi and Janet story or Pippin story. If you look at the relationships and how we talk to each other, and that's probably next to clients, our main uh, 
source Grounding. of stories. Yeah. Grounding, yeah. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Applying micronosis. Yeah. The great thing with microanalysis in our view is you can really quickly start to apply that to your own conversations and to, your, to what you do. And there is an endless source in our view of learning still ahead of us. So maybe I um, would love to just show you a little idea that we have. Uh, it, uh, so how we co-construct meaning in dialogue. When we met Janet, um, she always said, you know, Peter de Jong, he really thinks that uh, what we do here, this is really kind of what uh, Kenneth Gergen is saying, and um, that's really about uh, how we co-construct meaning dialogue. And when we thought about that, it was like, hmm, okay, how could that happen? How, what, what do we do here? And um, we'd like to just briefly share one of our ideas. I will share screen now. So you should should see that now. Um, maybe to our, on our journey, we had an RV, or we still have it. Uh, we have uh, pictures on there. And one um, quote or one picture, one question is, what answers do your questions allow? And this kind of a little bit sums up the idea that we have and uh, how we see solution focus and the co-construction of meaning in dialogue here. Um, so we have a question. Let's say, what are your best hopes from coming here? Like coach or therapist or solution focus practitioner comes in with a question, what are your best hopes from coming here? And this is kind of an invitation to talk about your best hopes from coming here as a client. And you give an answer and say, well, I want to know more about microanalysis and to see where I could apply it, for example. So we have a question. We have kind of an invitation to talk about something very specific that's in the question. And we have an answer of the client. And what does that do when we see that? Um, with asking, person A introduces a concept or more, could it be two or three concepts. We went away from presuppositions. People, you might, uh, some people might know kind of the presuppositions research in microanalysis. And uh, we went away from presuppositions because uh, presuppositions can become kind of endless. Because if you look at the presupposition in here, it could be you have best hopes um, or you can answer best hopes or it could be that you are uh, you can talk, could be a presupposition of this question, or if you go away from the text that you're a human being and that the world works through conversation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So with research, a lot of researchers who try to do research projects with presuppositions, they realize the difficulty of where to stop with presuppositions because there is endless, infinite possibilities of kind of making up presuppositions in this quest of this question. So we thought, well, how can we, uh, first of all, teach that and understand that in a different way? So we said, well, there is something in there. Here is best hopes from coming here in there. It's kind of a concept that we introduce. We could have asked you, what are your highlights or were your highlights of today? Then the concept then kind of highlights. We introduced the, the concept of highlights. You might not talk about best hopes as a normal person not used to solution focus in your everyday life. But now you start to give an answer to a question that invites you with a specific concept to answer that. So you bring in a concept with asking a question. And with that, with answering, person B adds the content. And we don't know as solution focused practitioners what the content will be. When I ask you, what are your best hopes from coming here? It could be anything. Of course, we know it's something, sometimes some, a little bit limited through the setting here, through our cultural norms, maybe through what we talked about. But you could basically say almost anything as long as it's kind of something you can define as best hope. So we bring in the concept as a solution box practitioner with best hopes here. The client brings in the content with the answer. And with that, we have a co-construction of meaning. And the co concept and the, co the content here 
gives the co-construction of, in this example, we co-constructed that your best hopes from coming here, that's the red part, are to want to know more about microanalysis and to see where I could apply it, if you look at this answer. So when people go out, they say, well, you know, we, uh, we talked about best hopes, and my best hopes are blah, blah, blah. You see that there are two parts, the parts of the therapist, or coach, practitioner, and the part of the answer. So this co-construction is something we do together. And um, we cannot say anymore, um, you know, if we, uh, let me go back again. Uh, can I go back? Oh, oh. Well, you cannot say, say anymore that um, kind of the answer is the, everything, kind of the solution lies in the client. You know, if you look at the whole sentence, there's a part of the therapist, the part of the, of the, uh, the, the client. And it's not something that only the client did, not only something you, only you did, so you, but you did that together. And now we go one step further with another idea, because uh, when we have a question with a concept, we introduce a very specific thing with the question next to the concept, and that is what we call the answering spectrum. So we introduce kind of a spectrum where we would like to see the answer in. And um, so with the, what are your best hopes from coming here, for example, we saw that uh, your best hopes from coming here are the concept we introduce and the what are, what are is a very specific invitation for an answering spectrum. We could also have asked, do you have a, a best hope? And the answering spectrum would have been yes or no. So client could have answered, no, yes, I have one, or no, I don't have one. If, when, if we ask what are your best hopes, kind of what are, then it's an invitation to look for, on the one hand, many things or more things than one thing. And on the other hand, it's, an, it's kind of a wide spectrum that opens up many possibilities as long as I can say these are best hopes or this I can define or describe as best hopes from coming here. Could be almost anything, but not everything is in there. It's only kind of, it's defined through the what are and through the best hopes from coming here. And one of the amazing things um, is, and there is a, a lovely um, audio tape with mm. Gail Miller and Steve DeShazer where they touch on that as well, how amazing our clients mm. are. We talked about that today and how amazing they are in making sense to the questions we ask them mm. and how amazing they are in wanting to usually give answers to the questions we ask them. So it makes sense to carefully choose the questions we ask them in order to have them come up with answers that are, well, within an answering spectrum that nourishes hope, that fosters change, that, um, well, goes in a direction of a preferred future, that goes in a direction of what's working in the lives of the clients. And this is what we do very, very deliberately in solution focus. I would say more deliberately than in, in most other therapy or also pra well, practice, how would you say, worlds, practices. Yeah, yeah. practices. Mm. That we know at least. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a very, here, what, um, what changed for us with this idea is that solution focus gets away from a question-based or listening-based approach to a very deliberate way of co-constructing meaning in the dialogue with our clients, together with our clients. So here we have a concept with answering spectrum content. We have a co-construction that happens here. Um, we had that before, my best hopes from coming here. Now highlighted with the R, also the answering spectrum that is in there. So in our view, these three things kind of give, give a direction with the concept, give a kind of a, a focus or a bandwidth with the answering spectrum and give content with the answer. And now we, have, oops, we brought an example for you just out of our own conversations. We wanted to bring in an example of a life conversation, real life conversation. And since um, we record that, then we will um, also publish that uh, on the SF24 website and everybody can see that. We did not bring the one we initially wanted, but we brought one out of our um, microanalysis course, just one that, that where Elfie uh, coached me. And I also will also share um, screen with you now with audio. You should also be able to listen to that now. Let me 
Let's see. We'll try that again. Maybe. So the program you see here is ELAM. That's the program we use when we do microanalysis of our conversations. And it's also a great program to use for uh, trainings, for example, or for sessions like that, because uh, compared to another video player, you don't have to kind of look and search for your um, timestamps. You have them all here. You can just briefly show a little, little uh, ad, um, advertisement for uh, Elan. Um, it's a free of charge software, yeah. so everyone can have that, access that, and use that. So Max Planck Institute in Germany is uh, distributing that. And you see all the annotations we made. Uh, these are all the things that Elfie said, Elfie transcript, we have Dominic transcript, and we have many things more we can add in ELAN. Um, what we want to show you is just one question. You can also see it here, but just so you also can hear it. Uh, the question that Elfie asks is the following. And it's the second, uh, it's the first it's, it starts with, thank you very much for having this conversation with me, Dominic. Then uh, I say thank you, and then Elfie goes on with this question here. So suppose our conversation, which will take about five minutes, was really, really useful for you. How might you notice? Hope, or we hope that you were able to hear that. We have the text. Just let me invite people in again. Um, we have the text. We'll share the PowerPoint document again with you. And there we have the text, just if you were not able to hear that. So, so if we look at the concept and look at the answering spectrum, the, the question was, so suppose our conversation, which will take about five minutes, was really, really useful for you. How might you notice? And uh, now, of course, you can now think of what, what, what is the concept that Elfie introduces here? Um, it's an invitation to notice that the conversation was really, really useful. And uh, to tell how I would notice that. So the concept here is our conversation was really, really useful, how and the, the noticing part. And the answer, let me see um, the answering spectrum first. The answering spectrum. So suppose our conversation, will, which will take about five minutes, was really, really useful for you. How might you notice? And with the how might you and the how, we have a kind of a bandwidth within an answer is uh, considered as an answer. Um, and it's a dif different, uh, I could, you could also have asked me, uh, do you think, would you notice, for example? Then it's, uh, I would have said yes or no. Or she could have asked me, well, what would you notice? And then we had a little bit different co-construction, not how I will notice, but what I will notice. And this is a slightly different co-construction here. Um, here it's a co-construction that I might notice that the conversation was really, really useful. And then I have to tell something that would happen in the future. So this is the conversation and the co-construction that we have. Now, when we look at the answer now, and that's of course interesting then uh, because clients answer. So they answer inside the answering spectrum, but also outside. So he, I could have said, you know, this is a stupid question. I don't want to answer that for example, then there's no answer. Or I could have said, you know, uh, that's interesting, um, but let me tell you first about my problem, for example. Then um, it's also kind of, it would not be considered an answer to the question, it would be considered something kind of an other direction to go. And then I would have to follow up with another question to co-construct the differences after the conversation here. So when we look at um, um, the answer here, What am I saying? Oops. Computer's a little bit slow with uh, this way here. 
So this is the answer. Uh, I think it would be nice to have some clues what to do next and also to kind of find things that uh, well we can or I or we can do but on the other hand that are not too much work so here it stops and then it goes on with another part of the answer but we'll just leave it with this part here so when we go back to our PowerPoint slide, just have a little bit of patience with us, and then we'll come to your breakout session to discuss about that. So um, what did we do here? Concept again, huh? suppose our conversation, which will take about five minutes, was really, really useful for you. How might you notice? We have concept and answering spectrum. And the answer is, I think it would be nice to have some clues what to do next and also kind of find things that I or we could do. But on the other hand, that are not too much work. And I cut out, we cut out the, the R's and M's in there. So the co-construction that is going on here is when our conversation was really, really useful, he or I, Dominic, would notice that he would have some clues what to do next and also kind of find things that he or they can do. But on the other hand, that are not too much work and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we usually go about telling the story of the conversation. We go out and tell a story where we have parts of both the client and the therapist in there. And now, of course, it's interesting to talk about what co-construction do we want to foster and amplify hope and change. I would just read because there was um, like in the chat I read some someone wrote, can we go mm -hmm. to the chat with you? Um, someone wrote I, I love that the thinking spectrum mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so the answering spectrum and the thinking spectrum and one of the things we are currently looking at is in conversations as um, some of you also um, wrote in, in the chat that not every answer is within the mm -hmm. answering spectrum but it's very interesting because um, when we look at that, um, we, we look at what part of the answer is in the answering spectrum, what part of the answer is outside of the answering spectrum. And um, we often notice that clients, even though there is a part that's outside of the answering spectrum, usually at least say something like, yes, or I don't know, or mm -hmm. they somehow comment on, on the offer we give them. And this is one of the things we are currently looking closer at because um, that seems very mm. yeah, interesting to, to us to explore that a bit deeper. Yeah, there seem to be different ways of uh, kind of uh, answering within the answering spectrum and answering outside of the answering spectrum. And one of the ways we are interested is the parts where people answer a little bit and then they go off to another topic. Of course, then it's interesting what co-construction is happening there. And what you might also see if you record the video of the conversation and also kind of look at your questions and answers like that, you might see that your concepts that they introduce that they come back like 15 minutes later, suddenly the person says, you know, um, I, I was hoping for, in the beginning I was hoping for, and now it's this and this and this. So you find these concepts that they introduce and we cannot, if, if we hear stories like, or the kind of the, the, the idea of, we can, we don't, don't leave a footprint, for example. In this view, you, there's, it's impossible to leave a footprint because you have a part of the story that is told by the client and by you is part, is, is part of what you introduce with your concepts. So when you hear those concepts and therefore it's very important for us to think and, and deliberately um, choose what concepts we introduce and what we don't introduce as concepts in a conversation. Um, and now the interesting question, we talked about that um, before when we um, prepared the workshop, hope and change. How do we co-construct hope and change in our dialogues? And we can go back to the question that we had and to the, to the uh, text. But before we do that, we'd like to invite you to breakout sessions of four people to think of your kind of ideas for questions or for kind of concepts to introduce. And maybe you have uh, concepts that you already introduced in your solution focus practice that are very useful where you have this co-construction and just 
you know, think of the question, think of the concept you introduced there, and also of kind of a possible answer and what the co-construction would be. And we just let, oh, good. good, so four people, um, 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and just look at a few of your versions. So the question, what question and what concept in the question fosters hope and change? For you and what is the co-construction that you that happens there or that you want to happen there and we'll put you into 13 breakout rooms of four people and you should see a button now if you press that you will be in your breakout group hello Elfie Dominic, I seem to be... Um, Hi, Martin. Good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. It's really good. This, this is really interesting, but I seem to be outside of a room. <laughs> so maybe yeah, maybe we can talk. What was, what was interesting so far for you? Um, I, I, I was just saying to, to George, was, was saying something really interesting, and um, we, we came out of the meeting. Um, I, was find, I find it very hard not to have... Uh, hope in the conversation mm -hmm. and so that 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 thread is always carried from the, the, the moment that you first say what are your best hopes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are talking that somehow that first introduction of that and i think evan said something about this being a unique question mm -hmm. but once that's um clarified what the journey is then then it's carried with any every description mm -hmm. so each question then is always carrying that idea. Mm -hmm. um, I liked I liked the uh, answer spectrum, and mm. I heard it put like that, which is great. Mm -hmm. But it seems, um, in a way, it's one of those things that's so obvious when someone says it like that. That as you're listening, um, there are opportunities to ask a further question. In mm -hmm. and, and, and the answer spectrum, what someone's saying is introducing lots of opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to thinking through what you <laughs> what you've mm -hmm. thrown at us here. Mm -hmm. So and and I put something and I don't think I phrased it very well in the in the initial chat that when we ask those questions, our intentions, how we select those um, words from what someone's saying in the answer spectrum reflect somehow our intention for the work mm -hmm. that we're we're trying to collect um something that um has meaning connected to their hope that that creates a description of change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. does that make sense i think i think um mm -hmm. So, so it, like, like uh, Elf said, this is incredibly interactive. This process and how how you view it, perhaps outside of the interaction, if you're watching Bibiana and the dogs interacting, mm. you 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 interpret differently from your perspective. But when you're in the interaction, mm. your uh, your perception is your subjective view mm. of the words they're saying and your intentions, the words that you collect will be part of what you believe or you have heard connects to, to the hope. Mm. Yeah, I mm. love what, what you say, because this is like just, yeah, one of the things that's um, yeah, very important yeah. for us to, to highlight also in the course, we can, like the, when we talk about hope, there is, of course, there are questions like best hopes where we, co-construct very obviously hope but then there are assumptions we have about hope yeah we'll touch on that um mm -hmm. yeah. after we are back but um so it's it's like really looking at do we see in our questions the assumptions we have reflected i think that's the mm. like what we can do with microanalysis we can look very closely at the video if the assumptions we have are reflected yeah. in what we are doing <laughs> or what we think we do mm -hmm. Yes, it's so difficult to sit outside your mm. perceptions and assumptions, isn't it? Your yeah. core constructs, how you look at something. Mm. I think there's two things that are in my head right now. One is Chris uh, talking about not knowing so that your intentions are perhaps kept as low 
key as possible. And Eliot's talking about asking questions from the heart in the, in the belief that the person you're talking to has the capacity and, and as he says it as a superhero mm. and that's what you're trying to uncover so that might um, uh, moderate that process in that way mm. so that uh, 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 it's very difficult as you're asking the questions to think now is that a question that that person might find um, mm. not difficult to answer but might even find a challenge to answer in a in a cultural way or a social way or or mm. what what have i said that might have a completely different meaning to someone as i've asked that question thank you but i i don't i don't i'm sorry i do go on i don't <laughs> think i think about that when i ask the questions so i don't know yeah. how yeah. how you gather words mm. yeah yeah that's an important thing Thank you. So, thank you, Martin. This was just the <laughs> no, end of our group much. process here in the main room. <laughs> you had, the, you yeah. had a question. Yeah, so thank you very much for coming back again. And now, of course, we're curious, what were some of your concepts and maybe questions that you, and co-constructions that you introduce in your conversations? If you look at it through this lens. We discussed that. You can just unmute yourself. Maybe not everybody at the same time. Okay. Hello, yeah. everyone. Hi. Uh, I'm Raya Gould. I'm from Scotland. I'm calling from Scotland. Been from Scotland. <laughs> um, uh, I was in a group with uh, Stefan and Stacy, mm -hmm. and we had three questions. The first one is starting with a conversation with suppose. Mm -hmm. Although that's not exactly a, a mm -hmm. question in itself, but starting com a, a question with that, uh, the concept is anything's possible mm -hmm. because it's like, it, it's, uh, I think Stefan said, unbridled possibility. Mm -hmm. um, the second one was what difference will that make mm -hmm. or might that make, um, which in the concept is in there is something will be different. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was what would others notice? Mm -hmm. And the concept in there would be there will be something observable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we just ask you and the, the group with the just what difference would that make? It's exactly the question, the next question that Elfie uh, asked me in, the, in this conversation. What difference or what differences would that make? Where is hope or change reflected in this question? I think it's there because that someone is starting a question with the sense that they want something to be different. They want mm -hmm. there to be, that they maybe are on a trajectory and they're not happy at the moment where that outcome might take them. And therefore mm -hmm. the possibility that they might pop out somewhere mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. is hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is, um, thank you, Raya. That's, um, um, yeah, very inspiring to hear like your questions and um, yeah, with the concepts. And one of the things that's very interesting for us and very important to highlight at this point is that um, when we look at microanalysis, we can see, we can observe what we do in an interactional way. But it doesn't say anything about what's what's right or wrong or good or bad. Um, and any practitioner could mm. look at it. And if we would ask, a, I don't know, a psychoanalyst, for instance, um, or a CBT um, um, practitioner or whatever, from, for, or a mm. hypnotherapist, they might have come up with different ideas and with different assumptions. So what we... Um, really love to encourage people is to think about their assumptions for change, their assumptions for hope. Like mm -hmm. there, for instance, I know Heather Fisk um, is very often, or Tony Kim mm -hmm. I heard referring to, a lot of solution-focused practitioners I think are referring to um, Schneider and his concept of hope where he says there are, when we, we talk about hope, um, that there are like two things that are important for people to see a pathway which means that something will, you know, the, the, the idea that something mm. will change or be different in a positive way in mm. the future. 
uh, or to see that, to see this possibility, and then also the agency. So, and if we follow this, I think we do a lot of things in, in mm. our solution focused questions or not in, in mm. our interactions mm. to mm. invite that. Mm. Um, and when we look at change, we have a lot of assumptions about change that are quite different to other approaches again. And to, and also among each other, like, I mean, if you would ask three practitioner, three practitioners, you might not find the three same assumptions about change, or we might say that, but if we really go into detail, we, we might have like mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. so similar ideas. And what is interesting when we say what the differences would that make, and uh, we have an idea, an assumption of, of uh, hope, for example, and we have this pathway idea or this agency idea, then of course the um, how would you know this is important. But what we see in microanalysis, we just see what differences would that make. It would make differences. And the person would say, you know, um, uh, if, I, if I had that or saw that, then this and this would be different. So there's no word of hope in there. So in a microanalysis way, we, would, we wouldn't talk about hope in there because it's not, just not there in the words. But of course, it is there if we um, see what assumptions do we have. And uh, also the assumption, why is hope important here in the conversation? Best hopes question there, we have the word, of course, and then we co-construct best hopes. Um, it's a little bit different with change, um, because if we say what differences would that make, then change, a difference is, of course, something that is changed or it's kind of close to change, but still it's, uh, there's no word of change in there. So um, what is interesting here, um, hope and change are, also kind of co-constructed in this way through our assumptions and everybody might do that differently uh, did, uh, did someone have a question with the change in there can okay, solution first question with the word change yeah beverly um we i think we talked about two one was that mark brought up about you know what's already changed mm -hmm. since before mm -hmm. between the time you made the appointment and now looking at you know what what a person's already done mm -hmm. and even if something hasn't changed in particular it's how they've worked how they've tried or what they've tried so that they're already talking about their own efficacy as far as even before you before they've even talked about the problem and um the other one we talked about as far as change was um <clears throat> which is a, a kind of condensed version that the solution focused possibilities people came up with, which is, you know, what are five things that you've already done towards this? Mm -hmm. And having people start thinking about that. And I've asked that, especially in our really short half hour conversations during COVID that we offered to uh, the, uh, the people of BC, everybody had done something. Mm -hmm. And so they were already were talking about mm -hmm. what they have already done that we could just take forward and we didn't have to give advice. Mm -hmm. And with our assumption that things they have already done is part of change, yeah. we, we co-construct change here. And the first question, of course, we co-construct change also kind of verbally in a sense that we have the word. And then we have the answer and you could go out and say, well, my client said, or I said to the therapist that um, this and this would have changed in my best hopes, for example. So these, these constructions that we have, the, the stories that we hear, we hear the concept, the answering spectrum, and also, also the, the content, and here would be hope and change. And what we find interesting, maybe before we come to kind of the closing here, if you would like to have the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, um, please uh, put your email in the chat, just that we can send it to you, will not be spammed with anything else, we'll just get the PowerPoint if you want to have it. Um, if you, can also wait till uh, the recording is published or uh, we'll probably also publish to the PowerPoint somewhere else. But if you want to have it just with an email, just pop your email address in the chat. I would love to comment on, on one thing that, um, so what we did now is we looked at, um, at the idea of concept and answering spectrum. And you might have noticed that we didn't put the equal mm. um, sign there, but we put the kind of equal, I don't know how this is called in English, <laughs> the approximate co-construction. 
because of course there is much, much more we do in a conversation. And when we receive an answer, there are so many things we are constantly doing. So it's not a co-construction from a question and then an answer only, but in between we nod, we smile, we, have, we look at each other and all these things, and that's very, very tiny little things we do. Um, make a difference for the story that is told to us mm. or for the things we co-construct together in this dialogue. And there is a wonderful study um, Janet Bevelis did and she said she wouldn't do that again <laughs> because it's not ethical. <laughs> um, but it's, I think it, it shows brilliantly um, the influence of the, um, of the listener to a conversation. It's a TCON study and they invited people to, to share a close call story and um, then people were invited to listen with their full attention and then other group of people to other listeners were invited to to count all the teas the people shared while they were telling the story in a face-to-face -face dialogue so and um well now the question is who that after that they showed the tapes to other people and asked them who is a better storyteller and very very Consequently, people who were listened to with full attention were better storytellers because we could, and there is this, this concept of calibration coming in or grounding that you mentioned earlier, Mark, in, in the chat, um, where, we, where we would, um, with our gazes, confirm that we are listening to each other, that we nod, and these are tiny, tiny little things we do constantly in each dialogue. And your nods you're making right now might influence what I'm saying right now. So without you all, I might tell a completely different story right now. And this is this fascinating thing of a face-to-face of a -face dialogue. And if you go deeper into microanalysis. Mm. And we also, uh, just a little, we could go on for hours probably. <laughs> we'll stop more or less on time. If we go back to our ELAN, and it's just, we just did a little, little thing. Uh, you see that here, for example, with the nods. And um, yeah. you see that the... And you see, maybe this is like the, the thing I wanted to refer to as well, that you see that we have different tiers here. Mm -hmm. So we would never observe, um, write the transcript and look at our generic listener responses and look at co-speech mm -hmm. gestures and gaze windows at the same time. Because you cannot mm -hmm. observe these things parallel. You have to focus at one thing at a time mm -hmm. to really well, observe that because mm. it's like so tiny little things that um, that we are doing mm. here that you, as I think Thomas Horak, you wrote like that you that you miss a lot of things when you observe, and that's true because um, we, well, we we, we we can observe things when we look at one thing mm. at mm. a time, mm. and you have to choose at what you're looking, and particularly when you look at interactions, mm. it becomes. Mm. And there's well, another, another difficulty with the, this interactional view. If you start looking at conversations like that, um, you have to let go of many of your kind of uh, phrases that you might say uh, about solution focus. Um, for example, that the resource, in German we have this uh, saying that the solution is in the client, for example, or that I'm just asking questions and uh, the, the client is the brilliant person. Of course, he or she is a brilliant person, but we're doing a lot of things. Um, and every, every nod, um, can be, and you can show that, can be important for the dialogue. We don't know if it's important for the life of the client. We don't know that. We might uh, see that in the future or not, but we see what happens in a dialogue with microanalysis. Um, and that's just a, such a fantastic journey um, that we hope and that we think will change the way we talk about solution focus. There's also a, Elfie just posted the... Um, yes, uh, Raya, you asked the differences microanalysis hmm. made for us and we were, uh, um, thank you for this question. We put together a list, it's like, I think four A4 pages yeah. around um, where we put together the differences that microanalysis made for us in our interactions, in our training and doing supervision. And you can download that for free on, on www.sfontour.com slash microanalysis. And there you will, will find the link to the PDF that you can um, download. Mm -hmm. And you will also find um, yeah, more about our online course, which is about translating 
microanalysis or face-to-face -face dialogue into solution-focused practice. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Starting on August 21st, so if you want to join, please feel free, join us. It will be a great international group there. And if you, and that's uh, also something that's really of interest, if you think about this concept, answering spectrum, answer co-construction, and you find things that you like, or you find things that you say, well, this doesn't make sense because of this, or I thought of it and I have this idea, please get in touch and let us know. Um, we're really keen to, this is the way we also teach solution focus in our courses. Um, so that people see that it's not just the uh, kind of a sports of a few funny questions, but it's very deliberate co-construction process. But let us know what you think. Let us know uh, what your ideas are about that. Yeah. So thank you very, very much for joining us. I put in our um, address as email well, address. email address, so that you can reach us. And we are looking forward to what's coming in the next 22 Two. hours. Yeah. <laughs> So Stay enjoy awake. and thank you very much for joining us. See you in the next 22 hours. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.